Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Sam Archer. Uh, he is the Director of Market Transformation at the New Zealand Green Building Council. Sam is a sustainability consultant and mechanical engineer with 17 years experience. Originally from the UK, he has a passion for sustainable housing. Today Sam will cover the following topics. New Zealand Green Building Council, who are we? Update on global trends in green building, overview of NZGBC tools, commercial and residential, focus on residential tools and uh, technical outline. Put your hands together for Sam. Okay, so um, yeah, no, my, my name's Sam Archer. Um, I, I run the technical team at the New Zealand Green Building Council. Um, so I'm going to be spending the next kind of 45 minutes talking over a little bit about what New Zealand Green Building Council does. Probably a lot of you know that, so I won't go into a lot of detail. A little about, about our general tools, and then I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about um, our Home Star scheme, which is our scheme for looking at the warmth and comfort um, and sustainability of, of housing. Okay. So who are we? We're the um, uh, New Zealand Green Building Council. Um, we are a member of a kind of family of green building councils around the world. Uh, I think there are over 100 around the world now. I think we were the, can you remember Joe, we were the 10th, 7th, 6th Green Building Council in the world. Um, and we're a not-for-profit and we're really aimed at increasing the quality and the sustainability um, of, of buildings uh, and um, uh, infrastructure and communities uh, in New Zealand. Okay, and we want New Zealand to live, live, work and play in healthy, efficient and productive buildings uh, in a sustainable built environment. So that's really our mission. Um, and then a really important thing to get across is that we're a membership organisation, so um, we've only got 20 people in the office. The majority of what we do is in collaboration with, with you, with, uh, with uh, you know, all the different organisations that are members of ours, contribute towards our standards, contribute towards what we, uh, um, uh, what we put out in the, in the market. Uh, as you see, we've got 450 members there. We had 31 when we started in 2006, and we've really built up our membership. And you know, we've got members in um, pretty much all of the, the big companies and some of the little ones uh, working uh, in New Zealand uh, today. We've got some corporate sponsors. I'd, um, I'd be very remiss if I didn't uh, mention them. So we've got Bailey's, uh, APL Windows, uh, Razine, and Warren Amani are our four corporate sponsors for this year. Uh, so you know, we've got some really good backing uh, from some major organizations. So um, I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about why, why green buildings. Um, so you know, I'm going to start off by saying, well, you know, a lot of people think about sort of green stuff as being sort of planetary, and we've got to be reducing carbon emissions, all the rest of it. But actually, um, a lot of it is, is local. Uh, so you know, this is from a year ago. There was lots of press around um, sewage overflows into the Waitemata Harbour. Um, you know, I think a lot of Kiwis are concern, concerned about water quality. Well, a lot of that water quality, so everyone concentrates on water quality from Derry, uh, but actually our um, uh, sort of rivers that, and, and water courses that run through our towns are probably dirtier, and that's predominantly because of the way we build buildings, and we could be doing a lot better. Similarly, in, you know, air pollution. So air pollution's not that much of a problem with Auckland, but Christchurch certainly has problems with air pollution. So there's lots and lots of little kind of local things that we need to be concentrating on, as well as some of the bigger picture items like energy. Uh, and that's, that's, that's some of the stuff that we, we work on. Um, we've just had a, um, uh, a report done by an organisation called Fixed Step, uh, and that's going to be published on Monday, so please be, keep quiet about this. But, um, uh, you know, what a lot of people say to me is, you know, why, why worry about buildings? You know, um, we've, got, we've, got really, we've got a really clean grid, uh, supplying mostly renewable energy to our buildings. Our buildings are mostly electricity run, so, you know, buildings are not a problem when it comes to carbon emissions. Well, um, that's, not, that's not really true. Uh, and the reason for that is that, well, half of our carbon emissions come from agriculture, and, and you know, that's very, very difficult to deal with. You take those out of the equation, and then you add in the complete life cycle of buildings, particularly the production of um, uh, materials for, for constructing buildings in the first place, so the concrete and the steel. You then look at the operational emissions, so the energy from running a building, and then you look at its life cycle in terms of demolition and, and waste, and you add all those together, you get to a figure of 20%, so a fifth of New Zealand's carbon footprint is from the built sector. That's a little bit less than, um, than usually internationally, but it's still a big number and one that we should uh, really be doing something about. Um, and then another big one that we really concentrate on is, is health and well-being. Um, so we know there are some really fantastic studies that have been done over the last five to ten years that green buildings are also um, better for people. They have, you know, you have better well-being in them. Uh, so you know, if you improve the indoor air quality, um, that's, that's reducing um, VOCs, or that's Im improving the amount of ventilation you have in them, then you get an increase in, um, uh, in productivity in that work, you get an increase in well-being. 
If you increase daylighting in a building, then, um, then it's, there's some really solid studies, studies that have been done by Harvard showing that people sleep better. If they sleep better, they feel better, but they also work better. Um, uh, same with noise and acoustics. I think we've got an acoustician talking a bit later on, so you'll be able to uh, allude to that. So there's lots and lots of elements to a building, again, that are not just sort of energy and water related, the stuff that you know, me as an engineer, uh, I as an engineer concentrate on, but you know, other elements that are very, very important to a sustainable green building. Uh, and then finally, uh, we would really argue that green buildings are better for the bottom line. Um, so uh, the Green, green Star scheme that I'll talk about a little bit about after this slide uh, is for our commercial buildings, uh, and there's some really good evidence from Australia and some emerging evidence in New Zealand uh, that they have a higher premium, they, they have a higher resale uh, value. Um, one study showed a 12% premium in value, so that more than offsets the, the, the uh, extra cost of constructing to, to a Green Star standard. Um, same with rents, so um, yeah, and you get you get lower vacancy rates and higher um, uh, higher occupancy rates and, and and a higher premium rent in green star uh, rated buildings. Uh, and then I, I mean I mentioned productivity earlier on, and that's a really important one because if you look at that, um, well we've got one nine and ninety. I think of it as one ten and a hundred. But you know, if it costs one dollar to build a, a building, it costs ten dollars to run it, but it costs a hundred dollars for the staff costs. You know, so if you're designing a building that, that, that um, fundamentally reduces the amount of absenteeism, reduces the, um, um, increases the quality of the staff that you can attract to your building, that's a, that's a huge win. Uh, so really important. Okay, so I'm going to now move on to talk really about residential buildings. So I think everyone would acknowledge here that New Zealand has a stock of some really, really poor quality housing. That's something that we really, really desperately want to sort out as an organisation. Um, on the left here, we've got sort of you know what we often see in um, uh, in New Zealand houses. Um, you know, we often joke that New Zealand Green Building Council is very interested in um, or believes in people growing food at home. I don't quite quite mean mushrooms sprouting in people's uh, skirting boards. Uh, this is a picture from actually from one of my colleagues in their rental flat. Um, so there's lots and lots of damp. Uh, what was that? <laughs> There's lots and lots of damp and mouldy houses in New Zealand, as we'd imagine, and, and really want to move to. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and every five years, Brands does a house condition survey, um, and that's that's an incredibly revealing document. So they, um, uh, the last one was in 2015. They went and saw 560 houses. Um, half of them were were really sort of pretty poorly um, insulated. Um, most people don't heat bedrooms at night, so we're getting very, very. When when um, uh, researchers go and uh, look at the temperatures in at uh, night time in, in people's bedrooms, they they are really low. You've got you've got kids sleeping in fridges basically in New Zealand, and that's really unacceptable, uh, I believe. Uh, lots and lots of mould. So 50% of houses in New Zealand have mould. I th I've forgotten the exact figures, but sort of I think it was about 10% of houses have severe mould. Um, so yeah, some real problems. Um, the, other, the other interesting thing I think that came out of the survey is only half of New Zealand homes have kitchen and bathroom extract systems, and those, the half of the, of the survey that didn't have those systems had much higher prevalence of mould, so that we know that you know, proper, properly fitted ventilation systems make a difference, but we're just not fitting them. Uh, and then we get the health um, uh, disbenefits of, of, of that problem. So um, New Zealand has very, very high rates of respiratory disease, um, one of the highest in the OECD. Um, we've got a lot of excess winter deaths. We have around 1,600 more people die in the winter than in the summer. And there's an interesting paradox there, which is that you'd expect cold countries to have higher, higher rates of, of winter mortality, but in fact, it's the warmer countries like New Zealand. Portugal has very high rates of winter mortality. My native UK does as well. Um, and really, it's down to the fact that people think, oh, it's, it's warm for most of the year, but so we're not going to insulate our houses properly. We're just chuck another jumper on. But actually, that's causing a lot of um, um, you know, illness and, and uh, unfortunately, mortality. Uh, and like I said, temperatures in New Zealand homes are, are, are much lower than the World Health Organization uh, recommends. The WHO recommends that a house should be at, 18 degree, at least 18 degrees 24 hours a day, night and day. Um, and there's, you know, there's not hope in hell that we're achieving that in most of our houses. And then you say, well, you know, we've got a, we've got a long legacy of um, under-insulated houses. Um, is it really a problem now that we have a building code that has uh, insulation in it? So this was a study done on houses that were built post-2000. Um, and what it's really showing is that this is over a period of two weeks uh, about the temperatures in living rooms and bedrooms. I won't go into detail, but I think what you can see from the slide here is that most of the time um, the, um, the bedrooms were way below uh, the, the, the World Health, Health Organization uh, uh, levels, and, and for a lot of the time, the living rooms weren't as well. 
And why is that? Well, it's because our building code still has quite low levels of uh, insulation by international standards. Um, there's no requirement to reduce thermal bridges at all. There's a little bit around um, uh, metal frame buildings, um, uh, steel frame buildings have to have um, a thermal, thermal break, but you know, we see lots, I, we, we see lots and lots of uh, plans come through for our home star scheme and you know, we see concrete lintels that are un uninsulated, we see um, lots and lots of overpacking of timber in the corners of buildings, we see tons and tons of thermal bridges in, in, our, in our residential buildings in New Zealand and that's where the mould occurs generally. Um, there's little provision for good ventilation. So I mentioned earlier on about kitchen and bathroom extract. The building code still allows you to have opening windows and no mechanical extract in bathrooms and kitchens, unbelievably. Um, and then worse than that, I think the, the, there's been evidence emerging from uh, America, from, um, uh, from other countries, uh, from the UK, uh, that we're, we're increasingly building buildings that are more and more airtight, and that's a good thing from an energy point of view. Um, but brands have now got three uh, studies that were released in the last five years suggesting that um, our, our practice of only ventilating with opening windows um, uh, is under-ventilating a lot of homes. Um, and that's of course a source of then moisture and, um, uh, and, uh, and mould. Um, uh, there's no requirement to put any heating uh, in residential buildings. There's no control of overheating, so there's no test for whether the house is likely to overheat. Um, again, from my na native UK, there's some, um, uh, uh, that, 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 that's a problem that has emerged, so lots and lots of uh, apartments that went up in the last 10 years in the UK that are, that are very airtight, that are on busy roads, that only rely on opening windows and people don't open the windows because they're on a busy road, um, that they really substantially overheat and, and, and that's a problem. And, and then finally, you know, just in terms of sustainability, there's nothing about water efficiency or lighting efficiency uh, in the code. Um, and I'll just take my word for it. Um, in the last uh, two years, we've had reports from the International Energy Agency um, uh, looking at our energy policies. Uh, it was very, cr very critical of the New Zealand Building Code. You know, it's below the standards required in most IEA countries. Um, and the OECD uh, reported on our environmental performance in 2017, and then they, they said government should consider modernised and build building code. You know, our standards are less than uh, other OECD countries. You all know this. Okay, so what are we doing about it as NZGBC? Well, we have three um, main tools that we run. Uh, one is called Green Star, and that's for rating the sustainability of commercial buildings. I'm not really going to talk very much about that tonight. Uh, we have Homestar, and that's for looking at the sustainability of residential buildings. Uh, and then finally, um, in conjunction with ECO, we run a scheme called Neighbours NZ, and that looks at the operational, actual operational, in, in use um, energy performance of office buildings in New Zealand. So you can get a star rating for an office building, um, depending on actually how much electricity and gas you run in that building. Um, and all of our tools have the same sort of structure. They have um, a number of categories, so that's... Yeah, that's right. Okay, so our tools have a number of categories, and they're typically split up into things like energy use, water use, materials, um, uh, uh, and environmental performance of the sort of planting, things like that. So different categories, and then within those categories, we, have different, we break it up into different credits, and each of those credits has points. And usually um, they have a point system out of 100, and if you achieve a certain number of points, we'll give you a star rating. Um, that's generally how our, how our uh, schemes work. Um, just talking about Green Star quickly, uh, we, um, so for a long time, we, for the last 10 years since we were inaugurated, we, we've been running a, des a design and, and build scheme. So that rates a commercial building um, uh, at the point at which it's handed over to the clients. We also run an interiors one, so if you imagine you've got a speculative office um, and then a um, tenant comes in and fits out their office so that fit out can be rated in what we do. Um, two years ago we introduced a new scheme called communities, so that's if you're building out a large kind of master plan like a university campus, a new residential subdivision, you can look at the sustainability of that subdivision and that looks at everything um, other than the buildings if you like, it looks at the infrastructure, the roads, the planning and so on. And then finally last year we introduced um, a scheme called performance and that's to address uh, I think a very valid criticism of the tools that the, the Green Building Councils have run around the world which is well it's all very well handing over a building that you say you've designed and built to be sustainable but actually is it really sustainable in operation, is it really low energy, is it really low water, you know please um, um, report the actual performance of the building and so now we have a scheme called performance as well. Okay, um, and then all of our schemes run um, uh, in the following way. You know, you have a, build, uh, a building project team, the designers, the engineers, and so on. You have us, and then usually there's a, um, uh, some kind of assessor. So that would be a Green Star Assessor or a Home Star Assessor who works 
usually in that Brittle Building project team, and then they report back to us as NZGBC. We just run the scheme, so we administer um, uh, Homestar and Greenstar. Uh, we usually get a third party uh, accreditation, so we, we have an anonymous third party assessor who looks at your plans and your uh, specifications and says, yep, that's, that's in keeping with the standard. Port back to us, then we, we give it a stamp and say, yes, your building is, is, is up to our standard. So, Homestar. Um, it's a residential rating scheme, uh, and initially when it was conceived, uh, it was a 10 point rating, uh, so all the way from a one star building to a 10 star building. And one star was really kind of old, very, very poorly insulated, you know, 1950s um, uh, building, let's say. Um, current building code is around about three or four star. Uh, and 10 star would be, you know, a really, really sort of world leading, sustainable, very, very energy efficient uh, building, perhaps built to passive house. Um, over the last four or five years, we've, we've sort of discovered really that people are not rating in this one to five star category that was really reserved for existing buildings. And that's because, you know, frankly, if you've, got a, if you've got a two star building, why would you go through the time and expense of rating with us only to be told that you've got a crap building? Um, so, you know, we're, 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 we just found that people were not doing that. So in the latest iteration of Homestar, we said, no, no, we're only going to rate buildings from six star upwards. We don't actually think we should be giving a star rating to buildings that are actually not very, very, very well performing. Um, so, you know, why bother getting a rating? Why bother getting a, a Homestar rating? Well, it's because of uh, the fact that it's a nationally approved, recognised scheme that's been approved and, and, and put together by the industry. Um, uh, you know, if I had a dollar for every time an architect says to me, why do I need to bother rating, you know, I've got a, um, I know how to design um, sustainable green buildings. Uh, that might be true, um, but, but, you know, should your client take your word for it? Um, the beauty of a scheme like this is it's a nationally recognised scheme, so you can say, no, other people are saying that, um, that I know how to design sustainable green buildings. You know, how do you know out of, out of, out of these six buildings which is sustainable? We don't, you know, because they haven't been rated. Uh, and then similarly, you know, um, you can go into the supermarket, can't you? And lots and lots of cleaning products out there say that, they, um, uh, that they're sustainable, but how would you know? The way you'd know is if they, well, there's a New Zealand organisation called Environmental Choice, CCNZ, um, uh, and they give a stamp to um, cleaning products. They also incidentally give a stamp to building products as well to show that they are uh, sustainable, and we recognise ECNZ um, tools. Uh, and then finally, you've got the benefit to the, to the homeowner. Um, so there's some really good uh, emerging international evidence that um, if you get a sustainable um, stamp for a building, um, it will have a higher uh, resale value. And I was talking earlier on um, mainly about commercial buildings, but actually the evidence now is very true for residential buildings. So in Europe, um, for a very long time, I think for 10 years now, you've had to get a, um, uh, an energy rating label. You've probably seen them on fridges and freezers, haven't you, when you get an A or a B or a C label. Well, um, in the UK now and in the rest of Europe, um, when you sell or rent out your home, you have to say how energy efficient it is. Well, the homes that have an A or a B rating get a 10% higher sales value and 4% uh, rental premium in, in Ireland as a result. California, similarly, 10%, 9, 9 to 10% premium if you get the, the, the lead rating is similar to home start. Um, uh, Seattle at 9%. So, you know, there is, there is a definite um, uh, resale and rental premium for sustainable homes. Uh, and that more than offsets the small cost of, um, of doing the scheme. Um, so what about that cost? Well, there have been some really good studies done. We've had two or three studies of Homestar, and typically the RI entry level six Homestar, typically we find it costs around 2% um, uh, on the construction cost to do, to do six Homestar. And of course, that's over and above building code. So if you're already doing um, you know, your sustainable houses, then it won't be anywhere near that because you're already incorporating the measures that you need. So what do we look at in Homestar? We look at um, energy, health, and comfort. Uh, so um, most of the points are concerned with how energy efficient the building is, how comfortable it is, how well ventilated it is. Uh, we then look at things like uh, water efficiency. We look at how much waste was produced by the construction. Um, you know, waste represents probably half of New Zealand's waste landfill at the moment from con construction. Um, how the building uh, is managed and how it's constructed. Um, some stuff around materials, um, and which I'll talk about later on, and then um, just a little bit at the end around sites. So, you know, how well located is the building? Um, you know, how close is it to public transport? How close is it to um, amenities and so on? Um, so that's just uh, expressing that in a slightly different way. That, that initial category of energy, health, and comfort. 
um, which we think most Kiwis are concerned with. You know, how comfortable is my building going to be? How much energy does it does does it require to heat? That's half of the points available. Uh, you know, so it's really important to concentrate on that. Um, we also have some points around density and resource efficiency, and, and what that means is how big is the house? Um, we know that New Zealand is being, building or has been building bigger and bigger homes over time. So 50 years ago, the average house size in New Zealand was 100 square meters. It's now nearly 200 square meters. Uh, there's a very good report by Brands which showed that as we've been insulating our buildings better, we've been building them bigger, and the, off, and the, and the uh, net of, uh, effect of that is our buildings, and you know, we're using the same amount of heat to heat them because we're, they're much bigger in volume. Um, same with uh, you know, resource consumption, the amount of materials required to build a, build a bigger house is much, uh, is much larger. So right at the beginning, we give more points for designing smaller houses, and we also give more points for um, building houses over a number of stories. So, uh, one point for a two-storey house, um, two points for a three to four-storey house, and so on. Okay. Uh, and then looking at that, um, that, cr that credit area, energy, health and comfort, and the things we look at, uh, we've got 20 points there for, so a fifth of the tool for looking at the energies for, required for space heating. We then look at uh, efficient space heating, so that's the type of heating you've got in the house, whether that's electric resistive or heat pump, so on. We then look at ventilation, um, we then look at uh, surface and interstitial moisture, so how well you're designing the, the walls and so on to prevent um, uh, moisture um, uh, uh, build up. Uh, we look at hot water heating, um, how, good, how energy efficient the lighting is, how good your natural lighting is, some renewable energy, some stuff around sound insulation, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I'll move on. Okay, so uh, like I said, six, six Homestar is really where we want people to start uh, 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 rating under Homestar. Uh, I've got that not that scary. Um, it, it really isn't. You know, if you're already designing a relatively good building, you know, getting to six Homestar should, for most of you, if you're designing well, shouldn't be that hard. Uh, we simply require slightly higher than building code levels of insulation in floors, walls, and ceilings. Um, so typically, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, these are the R values we're looking for. Um, so I just point out that slightly higher the building code for the wall, um, the roof and the wall uh, in Auckland. The floor 1.3 R1.3 is the same as building code, but kind of. And since the building code says if you've got a concrete slab, uh, that will be deemed to be R1.3, even if it's quite a small slab, and the actual <coughs> proper calculated R value isn't 1.3. We say no, no. If you've got a small slab, then if you don't achieve 1.3, then you have to insulate it or do something about it. If you've got a typically sized house, then um, just a, a slab on grade will achieve, will achieve 1.3. And then similarly, for our int introductory level of six home star, um, the windows were required with just the normal aluminium win windows that we see in uh, New Zealand. Now, then as you go through the climate zone, so you know, if you're looking at Wellington, then Christchurch, and then say Queenstown, we are then um, ramping things up. I think for us, bizarrely, the building code doesn't really ramp things very much when you get into much, much colder parts of New Zealand. We think that's stupid. You know, if you're building in Queenstown, you really ought to be um, insulating much, much better than, um, than, than building code, and Homestar reflects that. Then we require some efficient space heating and hot water heating. Um, actually, for six Homestar, that's pretty much business as usual. That will be some, some kind of resistive uh, electric um, uh, heating. If you put in a heat pump, you get extra points, so it makes it easier to pass. Um, water heating again, typically electric resistive uh, cylinder. Um, measures to limit and control moisture. Um, so we give more points as you go through the hi hierarchy of ventilation. So if you just use intermittent extract ventilation, which is you know, 90, probably 99% of houses in New Zealand, um, so that's kitchen and bathroom extract and opening windows, then you get one and a half points. Um, but then as I was pointing out, I think we and brands both feel very much that um, as we're building more and more airtight houses, we ought to be looking at things like continuous extract ventilation, moving through to um, you know, heat recovery ventilation, as you would see in a, in a passive house, and that's what achieves the, the, the most points. Uh, and then finally, that one, we give a point for commissioning of ventilation systems. Uh, when we talk to ventilation suppliers here, and I've done the same sort of similar work in the UK, um, uh, you know, how often do we see kitchen uh, and bathroom extracts where there's a flexi in the roof and it's you know, slinked around 20 times, and the actual ventilation rate you're getting is a quarter of the building code requirement, you know? A lot. Uh, and then we're moving on to minimising thermal bridges. Um, you know, if you've if you've got a typical timber frame building, um, you'll you'll pick up points because we're not seeing the. You know, you just have to show that you haven't got any of those kind of high thermal conductivity elements running right through the, the building envelope. Uh, minimising condensation within the building envelopes. That's if you you know if you're um, actually signing off that your construction you've had your construction looked at in terms of uh, interstitial condensation condensation in the 
uh, in the middle of the, of the build-up. Uh, and then finally, if you go for passive houses, so we, we give more points generally if you go, if you go for passive houses as a scheme through the, through the EHC points. And we move on to water efficient taps and fittings. So a lot of you will be aware, aware of the Australasian wells scheme. So um, you know, if you specify taps that have, uh, and showers that have known wells ratings, we pick up points. Um, if you use LED or CFL lighting in the, in the house, <coughs> you, you'll also pick up points. Um, again, I think things have moved on from when we originally did the scheme five years ago that actually the majority of new houses in New Zealand are LED. And we've got good, good natural daylight, day, daylighting, so if you meet minimum window areas as well, we give, we give points. Um, materials with eco labels, so um, if you're building out of timber which has got F, which is FSC certified, if you're using paints that have got uh, ECNZ uh, stamps on them, so things like Resin and Dulux generally have those um, stamps on them. Um, uh, wall linings that have the eco labels as well, um, you know, we give points for those um, as a scheme. And then finally, VO VOCs, so looking at the, the emissions of VOCs of, um, you know, um, uh, linings, paints, um, varnishes, those kind of things in the building we give points for. And then finally, um, uh, you know, Homestar has come under a bit of criticism, I think, in the past where designers haven't concentrated on the things that we think really matter, like the energy, health and comfort and, uh, you know, improving energy efficiency. And in the last minute, they've had to scrabble around, you know, putting in uh, worm farms and, and fruit trees and things like that, which we do give points for, but actually we'd much rather you get the points for the good stuff. Um, so, you know, we have, we have some of those things up, up, up our sleeve if you need them, but, you know, please, please, please design to Homestar um, using the, you know, looking at the energy, health and comfort uh, first. Uh, and then I'm just going to finish off by talking about uh, version 4. So we launched version 4 uh, last year. Um, that was a culmination of a year's work where uh, we went and interviewed lots and lots of people, lots of house builders, lots of architects, uh, you know, um, and getting them to really criticise us for the scheme to date. So I think um, some of the feedback we got um, back was, you know, it's probably a little bit too complicated, a little bit too costly. Um, we probably as an organisation were a little bit too finickety about how we interpreted things, you know. So we, we have really simplified Homestar. Um, one of the ways that we've done that is for, for six Homestar, we've published on our website a checklist. So instead of having to go through 200, a 200 page manual to, become, to get a six Homestar rating, we publish just a checklist which says if you do these things, bang, 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 we will give you a six Homestar rating at the end. Um, and then we're now working with some of the larger um, volume house builders looking at um, what we call volume certification. Uh, and that's really where, you know, if you, if you know that you um, have a, a standard design or specification, a cookie cutter if you like, and you repeat that multiple times on lots and lots of buildings, then we can certify you at that kind of um, um, generic um, uh, building design and specification. And that means when you come to then repeat that design across lots and lots of sites that we've already signed off a lot of what you've already done. Um, so the way that works is, if, you know, if you, like, if, if you like thinking about the cookie cutter analogy, you supply the cookie cutter to us initially, what are your standard specifications, um, plans and schedules. Um, we'll audit those. If you get 60 points, which is our minimum for six Homestar, we can give you a Homestar Ready stamp, which you can publish in your brochures or whatever. Um, and then when it comes to site, because we've already looked at a lot of the, way, the standard ways you do things, um, the, the sort of site check is really just a kind of, um, um, you know, just a visual check of compliance. Um, I'll move on from that. So, um, just talking about the cumulative registrations. So, uh, we've had a massive uptick uh, in Homestar registration the last couple of years. We're now up to 7,000 registered homes. Uh, in addition to that, we've got another 20,000 which are in pipeline. So, that's organisations that are committed to registering with us at some point. Um, so, the, the registrations are really, really increasing. Uh, and, you know, I'd just like to finish with, uh, you know, who we're working with. So. Tamaki Re Regeneration Co uh, Company in Auckland, they've uh, committed to do all of their social housing with Homestar. And what's interesting is actually a lot of the um, uh, volume house builders that are working with them, they're deciding we're not just going to do the, um, the social housing to Homestar, we're also going to do the private housing as well. Hanuku Development Auckland have committed to do absolutely everything they do to Homestar. So if, you, if you're designing a, um, a scheme on uh, one of their sites, then it will have to be Homestar. Um, and uh, we've had massive success with some of the um, aged care providers like MetLife Care, Booper and Oceania. Again, they're committing to do most, if not all, of their, uh, of their designs under, under Homestar. Okay, that's me done. Any questions?
Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cost. Cost. Cost of doing home style. Uh, so, um, so the overall cost, because there's, there's um, three, three parts to the cost of doing home star. One is the cost of actually putting the measures in the building, so higher standards or whatever. And then there's the cost of the certification, to us, to, certification, certification cost to us to administer the scheme. Uh, that's typically around $300 per house. And then you've got to pay an assessor. Um, and of, often um, architects are, are, the, are assessors themselves, so you don't have to buy a third party one. If you put all that together, then typically we see it's two, maybe two to three percent of construction cost additionally. Sorry, did you say that um, uh, like older homes, you not you not really need to assist them to bring them up to a standard? Uh, uh, I did kind of say that. It's not quite true. We um, you, you 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 can assess an older home, but it would have to achieve six home star. So, so the reality is for most uh, old homes is you'd need to be doing a really major refit to get it up to the six home star standard and then, then we, would, we would be prepared to give it a stamp. So if you came out and you have a checklist of, of, of things that you would normally like to bring up to a, a certain standard? Yep, that's right, yep. And, and someone would engage, engage you in doing that? Uh, so you would engage a one of our on our website. We've got all of the um, home star assessors. So there's, there's the, uh, the, across the whole country, we've got a massive number of home star assessors. Like Hundred or so home star assessors across the country. You can come and assess. Yeah. Because I, I should have mentioned there would be quite a few old homes that would like to be brought up to standards like that. We'd love that to be the case. Yeah. 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 For sure. So to achieve um, six homes there in Auckland, do you need 150 frame walls? Definitely not. No. So um, uh, one, one, one frame typically starts kicking in in Queenstown. Uh, makes it. E I mean, if you're building in um, uh, other parts of the South Island, like Christchurch, it makes it easier to achieve. But again, even in Christchurch, we found you can get away with 90 mil. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, good. that's a really good question. So we've worked a little bit with um, some of the councils around the country, um, and some of them are offering rebates on things like um, um, development contributions if you do Homestar. We're, we're in active talks with Watercare um, because of that issue around, um, you know, they, they've got, they, they know that there's another million people moving to Auckland and, they, and they've got sort of structures not coping, so they, they're really keen on new homes being designed with water efficiency in mind. So we're what, um, if you want to build a water tank in, like, so you can reuse water, they say, yes, you can do that, but it's an extra 550. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, so you say, can I say, because they can't make money out of it otherwise, to do wastewater. Yeah, yeah. And when you can offer them an option of saying, let's put a measure on wastewater, they won't do Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you about it afterwards, but that's an interesting topic. Um, yeah, yeah. I have a quick question, Greg. What do you guys need as far as dealing with clients as far as material that helps? You can convince the clients to do this as well. Obviously, the option. Consistency. Because there's too many options around the um, like, There's too many different um, grading schemes, and it's confusing, and they don't. And so, therefore, there's the, the same values there for resale stuff, but they don't see that because there's too many options. Yeah. Just a quick balance sheet. Yeah. With the benefit, especially the commercial side of it, because, of course, the guys I deal with build the building, I mean, lease it. So, they, they don't see the benefit. Any, any cost yeah. You're talking about residential buildings or commercial? Yeah. Yep. So, so just a quick, quick data sheet that says, well, hey, if you do this, you're going to get better return. You're going to get better return. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 So yeah. 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 Yeah.